agreeing to do the interview. Not at all, uh, it's, Daniel. It's, it's, it's a pleasure talking to you. Nice so to meet you. Can I just know your uh, story? Uh, did you grow up in Singapore and how did you, how did Ottilie Chocolate come about? Yes, I, I grew up, born, bred, schooled in Singapore. Okay. Um, my friends and I used to, we all worked in different jobs and we used to talk about our dreams and our ideas and what we would do if we were our own bosses and I think at some point we just said how about we stop talking mm -hmm. and start doing okay. um, but we were fairly young we worked not more than you know a few years yeah. some of us only one or two years mm -hmm. and we were cautious so we didn't want to like you know we, well we couldn't really borrow money from banks banks wouldn't give us a loan so we cobbled together whatever we had and the premise was whatever we did had to be within our means because we had lived through this thing called the dot-com disaster. Oh, yeah. We had yeah. seen companies with sort of airy-fairy ideas, get lots of capital, spend lots of capital on, on crazy office space and things and then it all just sort of fizzled and people figured out there was nothing behind it. Um, so the deal was it had to be done really on a shoestring budget and um, well, I, I get credited for the idea, which is really nice. But the truth of it is, you know, like we, it was always a team effort. Mm -hmm. And the same people who were in it yeah. from day one yeah. are still in it okay. today. Okay. Um, my idea won over, not because it was the best, but because you couldn't think of anything else. Okay. And I told my friends, I said, you know, I love eating chocolate. Yeah. And there's this idea of this perfect chocolate cake, um, which I just think it would be great, you know, and, and oh, okay, well, then let's try it out. And we workshopped the recipe over weekends, so we were all still working. And when we were happy with it, um, we didn't do any market research or, or anything, but we started to look for a space and, you know, we started to figure out what we needed for it. And um, we just said, all right, let's just give it a try. But we were careful. It was, it was more like a hobby. At that time, I think because we all kept our day jobs. So okay. after work, well, one of my friends got retrenched. Okay. So she was looking after the store in the daytime. And then the rest of us would sort of run there after work. Okay. We would go there on weekends, but it was this fabulous adventure and, okay. and yeah, okay. great fun. Okay. And I know you started your first store, and that's about five to six years after which you started the second store. Yes. Right? Yeah. So what? What was the plan during that time? Were you guys hatching the expansion <laughs> plan or were you guys just holding on? Some of us would say there was no plan. Okay. <laughs> we were just trying to survive and, okay. and figure out the retail okay. world in our yeah. own way. Yeah. Um, I think it was, we were actually fairly lucky um, because the original store didn't look anything like a cake shop. You either had people who just passed by you thinking you were a clinic or something Thank you, I'm getting the cuts. Wow, well, I'm getting a lot of cuts. So. Wow, how do, are they all different? This is the uh, miso and... Is, is yeah. everything? Daniel, you're following today as I'm working. So I've just eaten four burgers in front of you. <laughs> okay, I've taken two bites out of each one. That's okay. And no makeup on. That's okay. But it's okay, this is work. Yes. <laughs> okay, so we were just talking about your... the gap between your first show and your second show. So what sort of led you guys on the path to start expanding? What changed after figuring out the recipe? After we had no plans, right? Yes, yeah. I mean, in, in a sense, we were not the kind of people who had five-year plans and ten-year plans. I think we just wanted to get the basics right and to get a, a good reputation and be more solid about what we were doing. because. Um, we were all still working full-time, so it took that time for the business to sort of get up to speed and then one by one we quit our full-time jobs to look after the business. So I guess it was, it was early days, it was transition, it was a lot of that kind of thing. Um, but we did have the plan that if things worked out and it was viable, and as you saw us leaving our full-time jobs to do this full-time, it was obviously viable. Um, we first wanted to make sure that we had enough stores in Singapore. We actually had people talking to us from day one about expanding outside Singapore. But we kind of held them back or we 
we kept in touch with them, but we said we don't feel that we should be going outside of Singapore until we first have, you know, at least like four stores or we know we have a base, here. a base and a system yeah. and, and that. So that's why we took it slow and easy, I guess. Okay. So how is it different from here and, and in Hong Kong and, and Taiwan? So how do you see, um, I think maybe even in customers or how you're able to run operations, I'm sure the employee mindset is a little bit different with something unique everywhere. What has changed? Well, when we first went overseas, it was very straightforward. We just said that, well, if you're living overseas, then you come to us through a franchise. So it was always very much at, at arm's length. You know, did, they did the setup. We would just come and, and visit and train. And I think over the years, we learned from franchising that um, there is no perfect franchise. Some of them work so well. We've become best friends. We've become partners. We've even stopped being franchisees and we've gone into partnership together. We're even doing different things together. Some of them just didn't work out. And what we learned over the years was we would look critically at the relationship and say, if can the store do better? Could it do better if we ran it ourselves? And I think at certain points we felt that we would do a better job because we owned the brand, we knew the brand. And it's different sometimes you knowing it and owning it and someone just treating it like a or an investment or a business. There is this part of business which is passion, which is you know running it like, like you love it, like it's your own. So we actually have started um, taking back some of the stalls. So we own and run the whole of Hong Kong okay. now. Um, and uh, yeah, but, but there's no hard and fast rules. Sometimes it just boils down to the people that you met and how it worked out. And, and how are you trying to make up for this uh, difference? Because I think that's the, the big thing about running your own outlets in different countries and then franchising it, right? The, the soul sort of goes missing a little bit. Yes. So is, are there ways by which you try to make up for it? Um, I think the, those people yourself. the biggest thing that we learned is that you can't do franchising from afar. Okay. I know that sounds weird, but yeah. we've realized that if we are literally in another country and seeing things from afar, um, it's too remote and you don't imbue the culture and the values and, and yeah. the work ethic and everything the way you want. So now when we do franchising, we actually make sure that we have a staff member who's prepared to live in the franchise country okay. for six months to one year. Right. Whereas previously it would be shorter times, it would be more visits and, and so now we say we treat it as if it's one of our stores and we really stay close with the process and that has yielded better results. Okay. Yes. Okay. Not surprisingly. <laughs> Good to know. Yeah. What do you think about um, so you're doing offering chocolate and then now you're doing everything with price as well. So how, is it any different? Is it just a different menu or? Oh gosh, <laughs> it is very different. Um, and you know, sometimes like I talk to my franchisees and being people in food, everyone always wants to know, like if they run a, a small takeout store, they go, can I run a cafe? And if, they want, if they run a cafe, they go, how about I sell hot food? And I do a restaurant and in the early years it was something that we we struggled with because the franchisor's assumption was that well you've come to me because you saw this takeout store in Singapore you liked it so why do you want to change it and there was this bit of a tension but now that we've been doing it for so long part of it we realize it's just human nature right you always want to push yourself a little bit more do something more and so we've come to quite a happy balance where I actually can tell my franchisees, listen, the moment you get into dine-in, you start diversifying, you get more products, you have to change the menu, you go into hot food, it definitely gets harder, much more complicated, yeah. and, and very often it's less profitable sometimes. But if you want to do it, yeah. do it with me, mm. right? Like why, or, or else they'll go and run off and do it with somebody else. Yeah, and and uh, it's really funny because after we do it and all the blood, sweat, tears, and like oh, they come back and say, yeah, you know what? This is running a restaurant is really much harder than just running a takeout store. But we, I think there's a value 
to having done something like that, especially for the staff. Okay. So we're sitting in, in Orchard Central in EWF, which is a spin-off, which was the first staff project. The Awfully Chocolate staff formed a project group and they drew up the menu of what they liked to eat. And you can tell they were all really young. They yeah. still are very young. Because, you know, it was everything had fries yeah. in it. Um, and yes, there are ups and downs and, and there are difficulties and it's so challenging because they would they would actually, like how I started, they yeah. do their day job yeah. at Awfully Chocolate yeah. and then they would come after and that and on. run on the project. But I think it's just spun off so many different things that we'll never look back and say, oh, we should never have tried anything else. Even if some of them will be maybe harder to do or, or even less profitable, at least there's, there's team building, there's thinking out of the box. We have people um, in front line who were back end in another store, but they came out of there to do the project. And similarly, we have front end managers who then went into the kitchen as part of the project and then found that they really enjoyed it. So uh, I think that's important that people sometimes step out of their comfort zone and try something different. Almost there towards my last two questions, I think. The, there is one thing which is relevant yeah. though as uh -huh. a woman, which is um, I'm so happy that I'm seeing my staff getting married, settling down. You know, they really were very young when they were right. really, and, and um and I tell them about finding the balance because it seems that in society now everyone's got very fixed ideas about work life balance. Yeah. And I tell them, don't fix yourself on the idea. I would say that my life has been very unconventional. You know, I, I do not conform to this idea that you go to work at nine and you're gonna come back at five and you just only find a job yeah. that's near your house yeah. and has you know, those kinds of hours and we meet so many young people, the moment they hear that the office is a little further away from where they mentally are prepared to work, they go, I'm sorry, it's too far. The moment they, and, and we don't, you know, we, we tell them the difficulties, we say, look, we're a retail company, so even if you're an accounts clerk, we want everyone to understand the culture, which is we're retail, so our busiest times are weekends, public holidays, and you know you might be called back, but we just want you to like be one with with the culture. And, and a lot of people can't accept that. But I tell people, I am a mom. I have three kids. Um, I really try and spend as much time as I can with them, but. I just don't do it in the conventional way, and I don't yeah. think there's anything wrong with that. Yeah. So, so many women, especially, you know, who want, and we want them to have families, and we want yeah. them to settle down, but I tell them there must be a way, and don't be afraid that your way is slightly different. Yeah, yeah. we can go. So, it's, it's so lovely if, if everybody has yeah. epiphanies about what we wanted to do about it always admire people who knew what they wanted to do from early on and were very driven towards that. Um, but I wasn't, I wasn't like that. In fact, even in my first job, I was still kind of like searching around. And I think that's okay. I think that the little decisions that you make along the way are sometimes as important as the great big ones because they add up to bringing you to where you are. So I, I'd like to think that if you make the right small decisions along the way, it's just as good as an epiphany because it will bring you to a good place and it will bring you to the right place. And um, it's not hard to make those decisions. It's as simple things as don't choose the job by how short the hours are and, and by whether it's near your house. Choose the job because, you know, it's, it's interesting, you're going to learn a lot. Sometimes don't choose it because of the pay pack. Yeah. Either. You know, don't look at those things which are very conventional things. Look at what you're going to be doing and what you're going to learn and grow and what you're going to put into it. And, and you need to think a bit wider. Okay. That was, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed talking to you. I really enjoyed uh, talking to you too. It was very, very nice.